Whether you're at the base of your own personal Everest, navigating the twists and turns of your career, or simply seeking inspiration to keep climbing, join us as we embark on a shared expedition of growth, learning, and triumph, where every step forward is a victory and every story shared is a beacon of hope. I'm your host, David, and together, let's ascend to new heights. Welcome to the Climbing the Ladder podcast. All right, we are at the episode five, I believe, of the Climbing the Ladder podcast. We're sitting here with Nathan Holman, owner of Holman and Holman Landscaping and Treescapes. Yeah. So uh, thanks for having me at your house. As you can see behind us, his uh, his business is rather successful. And the uh, the topic of the video is landscapes to Lambos, but not necessarily for the fame and fortune. It's more so the journey that you took to get there. Because every little kid when they're growing up, cuts grass for their neighbor or anything like that. So we kind of want to get into how we go from this little kid with an idea of where his life's going to go to what you're doing now. So if you want to introduce your company and and where it started and we can go from there. So uh, two businesses, it's a home and home and landscapes. We're a commercial property management company. Uh, We service uh, several apartments here in Knoxville. We do everything from their landscape install weekly mowing to, um, uh, even you know gutter cleaning or uh, sod installation, irrigation. We, we pretty much everything outdoors. We we handle with that. Um, and then the second business is H and H Treescapes. That was kind of a there was a big demand for you know storm damage cleanup and tree service on these properties. And so uh, we spent about a year working alongside another company, trying to kind of learn the ins and outs of you know tree maintenance and you know do's and don'ts. Um, and then I guess it was April, two years ago, we just pulled the trigger and went into it full blast. And, and that's, that's a, a very similar story to, to my businesses. You, you jumped in and then two years later, it kind of grew into this, this yeah. big success. Was that a plan? You were you trying to make it go that fast or did it just happen? No, it, um, it really just kind of happened. Uh, and truthfully, when I started the tree business, it was because I was getting burnt out of doing landscape. And um need to find another outlet, something yeah, something else to do. And and we have a great time doing the tree work. It, it's uh it's an adrenaline rush and uh there's a lot of gratitude that comes with it. You know, we're uh homeowners and, and cleanup and stuff like that. Everyone's so grateful for the service that we do. Well, I'm sure if you have say a tree falling on a house, that's like that's a big, big life event for some yeah. people. Mm-hmm. Um so let's go with with get to the name, home and a home and H and H. Yeah. Is there two people or is it just you? There's not, and and there never was. Um, I guess I started my business around 2014, 15. And when I was trying to make my little flyer to like stick in the mailboxes, uh, I thought that Holman and Holman sounded more professional. Uh, and at, at that point, I could also say that my dad had involvement and I could use his experience in you know, other fields, uh, to put on my flyer to say that I had 50 kind of, kind of, kind of like, kind of like a, a resume almost. Yeah. I could say, Oh, there's two of us. My dad's involved, even though he he really wasn't. And, uh, we could use that to say, Oh, we're, we're not just new trying to figure it out. What, um, what kind of area did you start in? Was it just, was it, was it cutting yards? Was it doing like rocks and walkways? How did, how did that Um, transition into let's cut down these giant trees? Yeah. It, uh, I think I mowed like 10 residential yards and I was doing some pressure washing and stuff too, residential pressure washing. And I would just never turn work away. I mean, whether it was doing a landscape install or pressure washing someone's driveway or painting someone's house or uh, trying to remodel decks or you name it. I think, I think as a business owner, when you're first starting out, you have to be a yes man to kind of get that clientele. But what I see in a lot of new businesses now, they're two, three years into it. They're still doing that and they're yeah. working 100, 120 hours a week. And we had this conversation maybe a couple of days ago over text messages. be like, if you look at it the other way, if you have the reputation, you have the work, people know who you are. Mm-hmm. If you raise your prices and lose half your clientele. You're doing half the work. For the, for the same. same revenue. Yeah. And it take, allows you to have spare time with family, mm-hmm. spare time to do what you want. And you have to have that as a balance as a business owner. Yeah. Because 100, 100 hours a week for three, four years, oh, yeah. it, will, it will knock you out. Yeah. We, um, 
in the beginning, I, I certainly had that period of, uh, you know, working seven days a week, 12 hour days. Uh, and it's kind of addicting once you get the work coming in and you don't want to say no. Yeah. So you, you don't, you want to, you don't want to feel like the bad guy, but at the end of the day, outside work is important as well. Yeah. Cause you could work hundred hours a week and you wouldn't have time to enjoy stuff like this. Sure. So, yeah. and you can't really drive one of these to with a mower attached to the back. So right. unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm sure somebody would make yeah. something for it yeah. for a YouTube channel, but yeah, we might have to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as coming up rather quick, uh, it's really honestly sounds, we, we didn't know any, know each other personally. We met through my business. Mm -hmm. Um, you were one of our clients for a couple, a, a couple cars now. And, the, um, my suggestion to get you on the show here was actually through Aaron. Oh yeah. Cause, uh, I didn't know anything as far as the background, as far as your business goes, but then sure. you kind of gave me some, some info on it and how quickly it came up. And I'd be like, that's a perfect, perfect opportunity because oh, yeah. people get, have an area to get stuck in and then yeah. they stay there. And it's, oh, it works for me when they sure. can do so much more. I remember your shop was on Edgemore. Yep. Um, it wasn't much bigger than this garage. Yeah, it was small. <laughs> I, so I grew up in the trailer park right down the street. Uh, so I remember going by there and thinking like, oh, what is that? And, oh, it's deep. And I would see all these super nice cars. And um, at the time, I was still trying to like kind of get my business yeah. going. And, and I think at the time, a super nice car for our shop might have been the odd 911. Sure. Or something like yeah, that. But yeah. I mean, a new Denali was was nice for that time when we were first yeah. starting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I remember driving by there and thinking like, what is that? You know? But all that stuff was kind of out of reach for me then. So, so what made you transition to be like, this is doable. This is doable for me. What, what kind of obstacle that you hit to be like, I need to change something. I need to do something for myself. Yeah. Um, so I, I tried to work for other people, other companies. I tried working for waste management and, uh, and I, I tried to like paint, you know, through the painters union and stuff like that. And, um, I always came back to, man, I, I can work all day long yeah. for, you know, say waste management and uh, their pay was good. Um, I can work all day for them or I can go mow three yards and make the same money. Yeah. And you're working outside too, sure. working on your own time. Yeah. And so um, kind of realizing that when I was getting started, it was like, well, I don't, I don't want to go work a 10 hour day to make, you know, 200 bucks. If I can just find a few yards to mow. And then get taxed on that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, in, I guess in the beginning, I was very small minded to think, oh, if I can make a thousand dollars a week, I'm good. You know? Yeah. Um, and you quickly learn that. That's not a lot of money nowadays. Yeah. It yeah. might have been maybe 10 years ago that could be sure. doable, but it's it's not going to get you into a comfortable living where you can work nine to five and be comfortable outside right. of work. Yeah, I agree. Um, so that was it. I, I tried to work for a couple of different places and it just, uh, I come to the conclusion that. I didn't want to work for anybody else. Um, it just, it just didn't really work for me. I, I didn't like the clock in and clock out. Uh, and I didn't like being, I didn't like being paid based on my performance that someone else, you know, deemed well or not. Yeah. And I think this is a very common similarity between business owners is that you get into this point where you're working for other people and you realize that there's, it's not enough. Yeah. It's, you, you don't want to build somebody else's dream mm -hmm. working your butt off while they're enjoying something else. Sure. Um, and I think that's a big turnaround for people. And when that really hits home, they'll find any way to get out there and either learn something. When I started the detail business, I, I learned on YouTube when I first started. Yeah. I watched hours of YouTube videos. Be like, how can I do this to not just be a car washer in, yeah. in my garage outside? What yeah. can I do better to separate myself? And my goal was to have that niche clientele where we're not washing cars. It's something more specialized. Sure. Um, and I feel like that's very similar to you with the conversation we had the other day is saying yes to everybody isn't always the best thing now. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Um, you you can kind of set your own, you know, dollar amount and, and what you deem as your work is worth. You're, you're selling to a quality client versus yeah. everybody. Sure. Um, as far as obstacles, either yeah, a lot of people have haters coming up or, or obstacles. They'd be like, you started this, you're in it, you're committed to it. It pays your bills. Is there any hard spots that you, you hit coming up through that made you want to quit or, or stop doing it? Or was there always that drive? Yeah. Um, I want to quit every day, <laughs> honestly. Um, 
so kind of backstory. My parents run a company. Uh, they were a contractor for Walmart. Uh, they started their business in 2001. Um, we still lived in the trailer park. I mean, dirt poor, right? So my parents started their company in 2001. I remember coming, I was coming home one day and I see a brand new F-350 King Ranch sitting in the driveway and there's, you know, brand new truck and our little single wide trailer. And I, and I remember thinking like, wow, something's changing here. Something, something's different. Yeah. yeah. Um, 2003, we moved out of the trailer park. My dad, uh, you know, built a big house that at, at the time was just huge, just Biggest house I'd ever seen. I think it might have been like twenty five hundred square feet. That's a that's a big jump from from a trailer park to a house. Sure. Though. Yeah. I think yeah. our the first house we bought were twelve hundred square feet. So yeah. I mean, it's not large. Yeah. That's a huge jump. Yeah. It was, it was um, and it kind of sat up on a hill, and so it just looked way bigger than <laughs> than it really was. But uh, so it you know my parents' business is kind of starting to take off. They were servicing all the trash compactors behind Walmart, doing stuff you know from. Uh, hydraulic fil oil filtration to changing the rollers on the trash compactors or, or, you know, cleaning them just main simple, regular maintenance yeah, yeah. And stuff. Um, and it continued to grow for like the next 10 to 12 years to where, um, I think we, we serviced every Walmart and Sam's club in 28 States. And, uh, during that period, my family went from, you know, broke and poor to now we've got millions of dollars coming in in revenue and we've got all these employees and trucks and, and we're buying property and bought a racetrack. And how, how does that affect your, your friends, your friends circle? Cause growing up, growing up in a trailer park, growing yeah. up with, with not a lot of money, you have friends that grow up the same way. Sure. When that transition happens, how does that affect those friendships? My, um, my friendships never really changed. Uh, I would say the only, the only thing that really changed during that period, my, my mother is a saint and she would just, I mean, if my friends wanted it, she, she got it. it. I mean, I, I remember a good friend of mine, we had some dirt bikes get stolen and we come back to town and, and my mom and dad had bought us both brand new dirt bikes, right? It was just, we had this money coming in. And so I think my family was like, Everyone's still kind of shocked by this, right? And when you go so long not having it and then you have it, you you don't know how to spend it. Yeah. Um, I think that was that was my biggest problem when I, when I started into professional baseball. We got a, a giant signing bonus at 18, 20 years old. Yeah. And that was gone in it's a gone. year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had this like 10-year stretch of, um, man, making great money, you know, uh, my parents are like putting me and my sisters helping us buy houses and get them in homes and, and, and we're buying property and racetracks and, and I'm traveling, racing motocross. And, uh, it was great. And then in 2013, the whole thing shut down. So it was like me, my three sisters, we had 40 something employees, the whole, the whole deal. Just, just kind of just a, a dead end. That was just it. completely it stopped. End. Yeah. And, um, it was crazy. I, I remember for about two years prior to that or before that, that uh, my dad would say, this is coming to an end. Save every dollar you make. And that's tough to do when you have a spending habit that's that's fairly oh, unhealthy to, to new money. I, yeah. um, you see it a lot with lottery winners. They'll go, they'll blow both of those winnings. It'll be a life changing amount and it'll be gone in a couple of years. Oh, yeah. With that, it's hard to get out of that habit. Yeah. Um, I should have taken my dad's advice. I absolutely did. I not. feel like everybody could say that growing up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, it was funny. He said that, and then I bought a uh, 2013 Black Edition GTR. It was the only bills I had. Um, spent all my money. Worked, you know, every day just to pay my car payment, and then, uh, then we lost our business. And everyone worked for my for my parents, right? So friends and family, and then everybody was out of a job. So at that point, um, no one knew what to do, right? Uh, and I started trying to kind of do the pressure washing, mowing some yards. My parents helped me buy a mower. Um, and that's kind of where it started. 
if, um, if you want that life back, you really got to find something that can yeah. accommodate that. Yeah. Um, and it was tough, you know, trying to like go out here and, and find work and find yards to mow. And I, I didn't see it being a, a long-term thing. Uh, I thought this is kind of means to an end until I can find something to do. I was going to Pellissippi at the time. I thought, uh, you know, this would just kind of help me make some money until I figure out what I want to do. And then um, there was a period where uh, we started mowing uh, a good a good friend of mine. And uh, we started mowing some properties for another contractor. We started mowing some apartments and, and some stuff for, for Knox County, the libraries and senior centers and stuff like that. And um, we were mowing a bunch. And then the, the guy that we were working for come in one day and was just uh, – just ripped us a new one. Right? It was just a total dick. And it was like the, the landowner? No, the guy that we were like working for. Okay. Um, was kind of subbing all the work to us. He came in and just ripped us a new one. And I remember looking at my friend and, and I was like, I'm going to take every property he has. Is, is that that moment the turning point where you're like, let's do this? I'm going to do this. Yeah. yeah. Um, I still had no idea how. And... Uh, I stopped working for him. I kept kind of doing my own thing. Then I had a, uh, I had a good friend of mine. His sister was a property manager at a property over off Cedar Bluff. And it kind of fell in my lap. The owners of the property had split. And so one of the owners took the management group and stuff, all the uh, contractors and, and subs and stuff like that, took all of that with him. So the property sat for about a month, not getting mowed. And they uh, they couldn't find anybody to come in and do like a one time mow, kind of get it ready for sale, or kind of get it back into business. Trying again. to just get it, trying to just get it cleaned back up. I mean, the grass was four foot tall. Yeah. Right? And um, so she called me. I happened to be in West Knoxville. I, I swung by, I looked at it, and and I just told her, I said, I, I'll mow it and I'll clean it up. I said, and I won't even charge you to mow it if you can guarantee me a contract. And. Um, she said, yeah, you know, I'll see what I can push through. I think that's a big thing with businesses growing up. They have these opportunities. To, even if it's a lot of people on the outside think of it as it's giving away free work. It's yeah. not. It's more of an investment in your time for the bigger picture. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of small businesses fall short is mm -hmm. that they have to make money. They have to make money because they have all these bills to pay. Yeah. But if you give away one good job for free and you get mm -hmm. the the marketing out of it, yeah, that could set you for the rest of the year. Absolutely. Um, so... We, we serviced this property at the time. It was just me and like one or two, of, you know, guys that worked for me, good friends of mine. And it took us three days. Okay. We still have that property today. It takes us about three hours. Is this one of those things where you, you have to mow it a couple times to kind Several of knock, times. keep it, knock yeah. it down? Yeah. Yeah. And then also from what we were used to, it was huge, right? I mean, we were mowing the residential yards or, um, you know, like the Knox County library or something like that small and, uh, maybe an acre two acres tops. And then we pull into this property that's 60 acres and, um, it was overwhelming, but, uh, like I said, it takes us about three days. We finally get it done. We go back in for me to like discuss a contract. She wouldn't let us do it for free. So she said, you know, yeah, yeah absolutely. A lot of people, when you yeah. start offering stuff for free, there's a, a lot of clients will be like, take something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I go in to, to try to like turn in an invoice and get paid. And she said, oh, we're in that 30. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? I was about to say, you didn't, probably is, didn't know what know, that what meant at that? the time. We, we run into that with dealerships. Yeah. And so um, she was like, well, it's, it's going to take 30 days for you to get paid. I was like, oh, no. I've just worked for these guys. I've not worked anywhere else at all this week. I don't have money to pay payroll. So um, it was crazy. And looking back on it now, I can't believe I would even ask anybody to do this, but I, I just asked the guys that worked for me. I was like, can we, can y'all wait yeah. on me to pay you, you know? And they were like, Oh, absolutely. Not a problem. I think that comes with friendship too. That's yeah. trust between people. Um, I remember our first year in business in the biggest shop that you've seen recently. Yeah. Um, when we started getting four or five employees, we had one rain week. We finished, I think 11 cars and there was probably $30,000 in work in the shop, but nobody wants to pick up a brand new clean car sure. in the rain. And it rained for like a week and a half. Yes, yeah, so and nobody's paying. Correct. Right. So 
that was the the one and only time I had to ask my parents to cover payroll, mm-hmm. and so these guys could get paid because a lot of these guys I didn't know personally. Yeah, um, one of them was my good friend, but the other four I had they just started getting. Yeah, how do you have that work. conversation? Yeah, so yeah. I wasn't going to have that conversation. Yeah. I, I my priority is always the guys get paid first, even sure. if it comes out of our savings or something. I'll find a yeah. way to do it. Yeah. It's tough sometimes, especially yeah. when you run into that situation. We don't run into that situation now because we've built up the sure. business savings a little bit. But that was a scary moment for me to be like, what am I going to do? Are these guys going to leave? Because now I have a full schedule and five yeah. employees. I can't cover that. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. Um, they showed me a ton of grace. Uh, we, you know, we kind of moved past that. And then uh, she said, hey, you know, we're, we're going to work out a contract with you. But we have another property right up the street here that we need you to do also. And uh, the property is a metropolitan apartment, right? It's uh, 33 buildings. I mean, it's a large property. Property's huge. How and how many how many guys did you have working for you at the me, time? Me and two other guys. That's a big property for three guys. Yeah, one <laughs> one truck, two mowers, three weed eaters. Uh, I was you know driving my personal truck. Um, and man, I I think we were there almost a week. Uh, we finally get it done. Same deal. I'm like, hey guys, I don't. Have That's it. almost like we got to start back on Monday to do it if it yeah, takes a week to, to do. Start over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we get the contract stuff done. Uh, I had never done a landscape contract. I had no idea what they were looking for. You know, I, I didn't know what lead for milk what's, was. What's, what's market, market price? Like, yeah. what's it worth? Yeah. I, I had no idea. And so um, they were so desperate to get someone in there because it hadn't been mowed or serviced in so long. The, uh, the maintenance supervisor said, here's our old contract. Just... Copy do this and yeah yeah and so that's what we did um we got it signed we got it all worked out started servicing those two properties on top of the few like residentials um i think we were maybe doing like ten thousand dollars a month and man i was on top of the world right there was in my head especially especially doing happen. it on your own without without your yeah. parents help or your parents business now it's it's something that you've built on your own yeah kind of coming to fruition yeah and um I thought I'd hit a jackpot, right? And um, and I remember, I remember my my dad had a conversation with my mom and said, you know, Nathan can't do that forever. He needs to find something that you know long term that he'll be able to do. I can't tell you how many times I heard that playing baseball growing up from teachers. It's just a game. You got to yeah. go through school. Yeah, and it's a uh, very very similar. Yeah. Um, they kind of had that conversation and, and they kind of brought it to me too. And um, my parents are separated at this point, right? Um, which, you know, had its own challenges as well. But then to think that here out in my mind, I'm, I'm crushing it, right? And, uh, and to see like the magnitude of, of, you know, my parents' previous business. And then for my dad to say, He'll, he'll never be able to take that anywhere. Um, well, that's that's a big thing too because success is relative to your life. We've had we made a couple comments on Facebook and some of your comments when you posted the the um, description for this episode. You had a couple nasty comments that both of yeah. us commented on, yeah. and it was which I deleted d- by the way. You don't have to yeah. make a million dollars a year to be successful. Right. We have we have episodes coming up on this on this channel that is. Thirty to forty thousand dollars a year, but they yeah. absolutely enjoy what they're doing. Yeah. It's something they wanted to grow up with. Mm-hmm. So I think the reverse side of that, your dad has built this giant multi million dollar business. Mm-hmm. Ten thousand dollars a month, you yeah. can't do that forever. Yeah, thinking to maintain the life that you guys had. Yeah, ten thousand dollars a month uh, is a lot for the average average person, especially in this sure. area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and he was right though. Even though on paper we made ten grand a month, I mean. I'm three, four thousand dollars in payroll. Yep. And then I'm, you know, a thousand dollars in fuel. And then I've got insurance. I've got all these things. And that's what a lot of a lot of consumers don't realize when it comes yeah. to business pricing. Yeah. Especially the bigger the business gets. Oh, like yeah. absolutely the guy down the road that works out of his garage mm-hmm. can can do it for an eighth of the price. Sure. But yeah. he doesn't have the insurance, he doesn't have the mm-hmm. the payroll. It's and it, it it gets exponentially bigger the bigger you go. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so he was right, you know. I, I thought on paper I'm making this much money, but uh, but really I, I wasn't, I was probably making less than, than I was when I was, you're back, you're back to that thousand dollars a week kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, it was crazy. I traded my truck. At the time, I was driving like an F-250, right? Larry, and it was nice. But I traded it for a Chevy flatbed. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I look kind of arrogant driving this nice truck and pulling this trailer, like mowing, you know, mowing these properties. Like, I need something more work tone, t- More toned down. Yeah. And I traded, uh, bought that flatbed. I didn't realize that cabin chassis trucks – uh, insurance is more than a standard truck. Does it go into commercial? I don't have a flatbed. I, we just yeah. use the 3,500 to tow trailers. Yeah. So I, I went from a F-250 to a cabin chassis 3,500. Um, and my and my insurance went up so high, I was actually paying more a month than I was from other truck. But uh, the next week when I was out mowing those properties, um. All the property managers, you know, talk to one another about vendors and who does what for them. And um, I had another property call me and they said, hey, you know, we've had some issues with our current landscaper. Do you want to come by here and check it out? And I said, yeah, you know, what property is it? And she told me and I said, oh, that's funny. I used to mow that property <laughs> for the vendor that uh, that you have under contract. And she said, oh, when did you stop? And I said, this is probably, you know, about a probably a month or that's so when ago, the problem started was when I was, <laughs> right and so uh, ironically when we had stopped mowing it and he had to take it back over and had to try and like you know then he was stretched thin they couldn't they couldn't provide the service that they needed and so it took me back to my comment about i'm going to take all the properties he's got and the guy was just rude and it wasn't like i was trying to be vindictive he would you know, he wouldn't pay there, there's us. There's a cause and effect for everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he wouldn't pay us when he was supposed to pay us or whatever it may be. But um, we signed that property. Okay. And then we signed every single property he had for that same management company within the next three I was going to say, th- is that something that you went to do or they they came to you? They came, they came to me. That's, I think that's even sweeter of a deal because yeah. you didn't have to go after it. I didn't know how to go after it. Yeah. Like, honestly, I um, looking back at it now... It would be so easy for someone to go in and, and get knock on the up. door. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I had no idea. Right. And um, so we did. We uh, I think we signed 10 more properties that same year. Um, At know, this point, you still got three guys or is yeah, this, we, is this we, like a, we need to get somebody else now? Well, so we had pretty much got rid of all of our little residential stuff that we were doing. Um, kind of turned them over to another, you know, I had, several friends that have my own businesses. And I, I do that with, with lower, lower detailers as well. Like we don't sure. do, we don't do basic wash and waxes yeah. here. Go to this guy. He can absolutely, absolutely. do this. Yeah. yeah. Which is rare. I, I don't really stick my neck out for a lot of people. Right. What's well, your name? It's your name too. Yeah. Um, so now we're just devoted to doing these properties and we're still doing it. One truck, one trailer. Um, got a couple more guys working. We're piling, you know, four or five deep in this truck and, and uh, doing these properties and it just kind of continued to grow. I, I want to say over the next two and a half to three years, uh, we grew that to 47 apartment complexes here in Knoxville. Um, and it just kept, kept going. But also with that comes, you have to buy more equipment and you have to have bigger staff. More, more work means bigger overhead. Yeah. Um, and staffing is difficult, you know, trying to finding good people is hard. You yeah. can, you can still, so we've had this conversation with hope and a lot of other business owners. There's a, a lot of employees or regular day job people that is like, Oh, I don't get paid enough for this. I need mm-hmm. to make more money. Well, it comes down to the person too. You could pay yeah. them two or $3,000 a month. And after a couple of weeks of doing that, mm-hmm. they're going to go right back to whatever yeah. type of person they are. And yeah. that's what makes staffing difficult. Yeah, I agree. So we've run into these like staffing issues, like, you know, all other businesses do as well. Um, but we've kind of grown it to where at this point now we don't do as many apartments as we did. I think we do, uh, I think we do 28 apartments and then we still service like, you know, eight or 10 residentials. That is this your time split between the, the treescapes too? Yes. Yeah. So, um, we kind of get up to this point, we're doing all these properties and, and, you know, I'm running wide open. I'm working these guys, you know, six days a week, every week. And I see this kind of, this opening for the tree work. Um, basically what would happen was, you know, a, 
there'd be tree damage or something on a property and they'd say, Hey, can you guys clean this up? And I, yeah, well, sure. We can cut it up, clean it up, haul it out and dump trailer yeah. or whatever. But, um, so we start to kind of eliminate some of the landscape contracts that we have and start the tree business. So at this point, it's like my staff is a little bit smaller. We still have the same amount of equipment because once you buy it, you just kind of keep it right. But, um, same amount of equipment, staff's a little bit smaller, not as many properties, some better properties, right? I uh, feel like the, the quality of work goes up with the price, which eliminates the yeah. amount of work that you have to do. Sure. Um, but what's crazy is prior to 2024, we never changed our annual contract price. Wow. I had no idea. Didn't know that was a thing. And that's part of growing a business too. If you're growing it on your own with no no mentors, like your, your dad had the business, but yeah. it's not not the same business. So you have yeah. no idea how to oh, word yeah. those contracts or anything. Right. I had, I had to learn it all, honestly, by mistake, yeah. right? Um, trial and error. I mean, the first three years, I paid all of my employees tax. I didn't know that you could find companies that would pay your, yeah. help with your payroll. I had no idea. I think I think the biggest thing for me when we started getting really busy and started making a name for ourselves, that's the first year we I think we had the Corvette for you that came in. Yeah. Um, that was the first year we really significantly raised our prices. Mm -hmm. And for three months I was pulling my hair out because I was so scared to do that oh, that yeah. everybody was gonna go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. I like I said, I, I never never raised prices. In fact, I would say out of the you know, almost thirty properties that we have more than half of them are still the same price they were five, six years ago. And I'm sure, I'm sure that's a lot of the, the biggest reason that keeps you busy. It's almost you're loyal to your clients. Yeah. We're not going to kind of gouge you. New yeah. clients can come in at a different rate, but this sure. is what you guys pay. Yeah, exactly. And then we have we have spent so much time on these properties. Now we know them so well. Did you do them in half the time. Yeah, what yeah. used to be a four-hour job is now a two-hour job. And so I'm not going to raise their price. Why, tra why charge you six hours when we do it yeah. in half the time? Yeah. Um, and what happens is now we have the opportunity and we've built such good rapport with our property managers and, and the regional managers. We can just kind of go in and say, Hey, we noticed this on your property. That's an issue. Could be dangerous. Might be a tree, might be, you know, an irrigation leak or whatever it may be. And we've been there so long. They'll say, absolutely. That's, that's true. That's a built in trust. We have a lot yeah. of long time clients like that. Aaron's one of those clients. Yeah. Like, I suggest doing this and he doesn't even question it. It's Wear it out. do it. Let me know. Well, I don't have Aaron money. Right. Just, says, just yeah fix it, it. Yeah. um oh, i'm sure you'll hear about that later yeah <laughs> we're supposed to do uh we're supposed to do dinner we we talk about it all the time where uh him and shannon and me and dom will, will drive the cars and, and we say that we're gonna do a dickhead dinner and all of us drive the cars right and just all but, separately too all separately. yeah yeah um, anyway we love them but uh, for those that don't know Aaron that's listening, a lot of you guys do. He is a real estate agent in Maribel. He also is a has a large number of supercars in his collection. Yeah. And when everybody gets together, it's it's a big car show in a parking lot wherever you guys yeah. go. Yeah, he's the reason that I kind of got out of the Corvette stuff and then bought the R8. And, and he, um, he kind of took the same path too. He had the, yeah. the Corvette, the R8, now yeah. the Lambos, and it yeah. kind of keeps getting bigger and bigger. I know. There's no telling what's next. Um it it won't be a McLaren. He's made that pretty clear. But um, <laughs> is that is that because of your 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 recent issue now? Yeah, I think it's because uh, he was talking yeah. for a long time. When we were thinking about buying his R eight. Mm -hmm. He was talking about getting the six hundred LT. Yeah. for a long time. And yeah, what kept him back was all the electrical yeah, gremlins. The McLarens are kind of finicky, right? But um, such a fun car to drive. But uh, but yeah. So anyway, um, it's allowed us to kind of you know build build a good rapport with them where they trust, you know, we're going to take care of it. And, and cause it's been years and years of, of doing the right thing uh, to where now we can, we can actually focus on doing additional jobs for the same properties that do pay us. So uh, we, we keep the contracts the same. It keeps that connection between me and that property manager. And now I can focus on, Hey, you guys need, this tree service or, Hey, we noticed, you know, this is damaged. basically the safety aspects of the landscaping part. Yeah. So, so once we retain these contracts, now it's, um, it's a sales game, right? It's, uh, 
now you're trying to go through and you're trying to perfect their properties and you're selling additional services. It's up, it's upselling in our line of work. It would be like window sure. 10 or Chrome delete or something. Sure. Well, you're here for this. We also offer this. Would yeah. you like that as well? Well, yeah. it's here. We can show up and mow it and, you know, mow, weed eat, blow and take off. We could do that all day. Um, but truth be told, the, the contracts that we, that we have pay the payroll and pay the bills and, and for us to make additional money to buy ridiculous stuff like this, you, you gotta be in the sales game. So, so what happens? You're, you're now in this. It's, we had the comment on Facebook the other day is, Oh, you guys must charge too much if yeah. you buy something yeah. like this or it must be nice. How do you, how do you react to stuff like that? Cause a, a lot of people, a lot of people in success react to it differently. Sometimes they really take offense to it. Similar to me. It's kind of like the more I hear that, the more relaxed I feel because it's like, I know I did this yeah, and you have no idea. I, um, I wish that I charged too much, right? Uh, I will say in the last, I don't know, however long we've been in business, six, seven, eight years, whatever it is, there's been very few jobs that I have walked away away from and thought, man, we hit a lick. On Could that have one. done more for that. or Yeah, yeah. Or, or like it, it's, it's very rare that I walk away and think like, man, we did good on this one. You know what I mean? Um, most of the time it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty cheap rate and we just try to do it efficiently and do a good job and just maintain that good. Uh, and I think that's, report. that's the biggest thing with the success to this level is finding efficiency to where you don't feel overworked and mm-hmm. the customer doesn't feel overcharged. Yeah. Absolutely. You find that, you find that happy medium and yeah. live there. I, I can say this, uh, and anybody that knows anything about landscaping, we charge $67 per yard of premium double ground black mulch delivered and installed. 67 bucks. For the consumer to go and buy that by the yard from, let's say, Living Earth, you're looking at 35 bucks just for the material. Then you got to haul it and you got to spread it. And, you know, so. I it's mean, a lot of time invested. Yeah. And, and like I said, we're, we're 67 bucks for that. Um, but we do probably three to 5,000 yards of mulch a year. So we can do it cheaper. We can do it more efficiently. Um, and it, you know, everybody kind of wins at, at, yeah. at the end of that. But most people, if you said 67 bucks to come spread this, no chance. Oh, I could do that myself. Yeah, I do it myself. Yeah. Right. So we're absolutely not overpriced. Um, I wish, right? I, I, I wish that even if we were at like a market rate for like the standard rate, we would double our revenue. And, but with that, we would probably lose half of our contracts because someone's going to do it cheaper. Yeah. That's there's always, there's always going to be somebody yeah. cheaper. Um, we just had the instance and kind of a window tint is very, it's the cheapest service we offer. Mm-hmm. I mean, we go down as low as two fronts for 120 bucks. Yeah. And we have a full car in this lot this past week that got quoted by another shop locally would do it cheaper. Mm-hmm. He came to us for more money because he understands the reputation we have. Yeah. The shop we have mm-hmm. in the install. Well, that same guy while the car was in our shop being worked on messaged the client saying he would go even lower oh, yeah. to bring it on it. And yeah. you just, there's always going to be somebody to go for that bottom barrel. Yeah. Um, and, and truth be told, we don't really provide a service that's substantially better than, than your average landscape. Yeah. Right? Ex- experience is a big thing. Yeah. Customer service. That's what I was going to say. I think what sets us apart and the reason that we have the, the contracts and we've had them for as long as we have is, we have great communication and um, we build a, you know, personable relationship with the property managers and, you know, uh, I know them and I know their husbands and I know their, their, you know, friends and family. And so we kind of build this like family. It's, yeah, I was about to say it's now, yeah. now become a family investment yeah. versus just a business, it's business, business a venture. Business yeah. yeah. And then at that point, everybody wins, you know, they trust me. I trust them. You have that sense of security it helps you kind of sleep at night, but um, it's absolutely, it's, it's a tough road to like get to that point. And, and like you asked earlier, you know, are, are there hurdles that make you just want to quit? And it's, um, 
I never thought about the, the statement, I want to quit every day. Because that's, that's as a business owner, that's kind of what it feels like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm very lucky that the staff that I have now, and I have some family that work for me too, I, I can count on them so much that when there's times where I'm, I'm so burnt out, I can't step away. Yeah. And I still, you know, even if I step back or... You're still involved. I'm still involved. Yeah. And I, I'll still, you know, send like a daily text to... Mm-hmm. Uh, to a few different people like on the staff and say, hey. Hope, Hope hates that about me because we'll go on vacation. My parents have a place in Florida and I'm on my phone all the time. He's like, what's this customer doing? How's this car going? It's yeah. not necessarily that I don't trust them. It's I'm still involved in it yeah. to, to to stay relevant if well, they have a question. Yeah, yeah, th- that's me. I, I still do it because I, I love it. Even our weekend, like when we're done, I'm probably going to the farm to work. Well, I'm I, the same way. Like <laughs> Hope, Hope absolutely hates it. I'll be like, all right, well, I'm going to the shop to wash the car. Yeah, <laughs> I've been doing this every day this week, but I'm yeah. going to go wash our car. Yeah, you just heard the Dom's car start and leave. She's probably heading to a showing or something right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's obviously the hurdles that we've run into. Like I said, I, I struggled with the tax aspect of things and depreciation and, and payroll. And there was all those things that I had no idea about. Um, so nobody teaches you that. And then getting burnout. Burnout is so real. And our turnover rate for like for our staff is, I mean, it's huge. A lot of people think it's it's easy. And I th- find that in sports too, it's relatable because everybody does it growing up. Like everybody sure. knows how to cut grass. Everybody knows it. Once you do it for a living, mm-hmm. it completely changes the way you look at it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That was, that was me with, you know, I raced motocross my whole life and I thought I was going to be a professional motocross racer. And we bought a racetrack in Madisonville and after six months, I hated it. Yeah, I didn't want to ride. I didn't want to train. I didn't. I didn't want to go up there. Um, once it becomes a have to, then you don't want to do it. But I still enjoy the landscape stuff. Um, but my thing now is uh, love doing the tree work. And like I said, it's it's such an adrenaline rush. Uh, it seems like with the pictures that you sent me before, it seems like it's an enjoyable yeah time, even just to watch. Like that'd be something I'd be willing just to watch. Oh yeah, it's a blast. <laughs> uh, so and my my nephew Gavin, he just turned twenty two yesterday. He works for me too, but um, I have to apologize to him almost weekly for nearly killing him, <laughs> like just because it's it is dangerous work, and it doesn't matter how safe or cautious you may be something at any point there's always an unknown factor yes and um it sounds awful but i love that i love like you know uh, we're working in rarity bay and we dropped an 83 foot tree didn't climb it didn't bucket truck nothing dropped it right between two houses and it's like that could go that could have went real bad there's any factor here that could could be bad um and but when you're done you just feel like such a badass it's like all right cool Let's do this again. Uh, um, that's kind of what got me here. Uh, it, it's uh, obviously there's been some challenges along the way. Uh, my parents, their divorce. My dad lives in Oklahoma. There's been some like health issues and stuff on both sides with you know my mom and dad. Um, how how do your parents feel now that they've seen where you can't? This isn't going to yeah. be made something, and now you you are what you you're at now. Yeah. It's, uh, is that like a, a, a funny conversation now or? Um, it's a, it's a good, like proud moment. It, I'll say that uh, my dad is not a very like emotional guy. Right? Yeah. He's um, go to work, do it or don't, you know, cut and dry. But we had that conversation and he owned it. He said, you know, I, I, I told your mom, they still talk and whatever, but he said, I told your mom, like, you'll never take this anywhere. You need to do something with it. And he said, and now you're, you're doing millions of dollars in revenue every year. And he's like, and I've, I've like choked on my words a hundred times. I couldn't be more proud. My mom, same way. My mom's always supported it. I always said, whatever you want to do, you know, you, you just do it. That, that's kind of what built my business to where it is now is if you tell me I can't do something, we're going to do it. That's probably the worst thing you could tell me because yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. Whether I'll find a way to do it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, obviously there's challenges with that, but, uh, yeah, that conversation now is um it's totally different. It's uh I think now it's me. Like when I talk to my dad about it now, he's like, Oh, how do you do that? How, <laughs> yeah, that? You're how'd you're that, not you're yeah, now the teacher. Yeah, how'd that pan out or you know? Um, but he's my dad's that like 
entrepreneur at heart, just always hustled, whether it was. Well, he sees it too. He sees your hard work paying off at this point. Yeah. And supporting the family. Sure. Yeah. Um, But I I did, I get that from my dad as far as the just workhorse. It, I might get some heat for this, but I'll say it anyway. My, my dad always said money comes before everything, family, friends. That's, so, that's, that's a big change for here in, in the South and in East Tennessee yeah, it's too. Family first because it's not even that. It'd be the ch- usually the church yeah, first and it, then family. Exactly. It's, it's your faith and then your family. And, and I get that, right? And Sure. But my dad, I mean, he embedded it in my brain that work comes first. Always. At the end of the day, you have to have money to do everything you want to do in life. Yeah. If if you, if work isn't first, then how do you support your family? How do you take care of your family? How how do you do, you know, how how do you give back? How do you tithe and give to the church? How do you do any of these things? If, if your first priority is not work and, um, that kind of stuck with me. Uh, luckily, Dom is kind of on this on the same page. You, you, it seems like you guys. I don't know you guys personally outside of of the business, but I follow you on Facebook. I follow you on Instagram. It seems you guys have that really close relationship. You guys support yeah. each other in anything you do, no matter what gets thrown at you. Comments, yeah, haters. It doesn't matter. Oh yeah, I'll screenshot it and screenshot something and send it. And I'm like, who is this person? <laughs> I no well, I, I think I did that to you. You're like, yeah. I don't even know that guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we do that, and, and she, you know, obviously she gets some little comments here or there about the car stuff or um what it is dom's addiction is buying homes and yep. rental houses and properties and, and she's a real estate agent yeah yeah um and mine is always depreciating assets <laughs> and so when we got together i said um i said i'll make it simple I will spend all the money in the world on stuff that makes us happy. If you spend your money on the stuff that helps us retire. <laughs> yeah. And she was like, you okay. focus on fun. She'll focus on wealth. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and she's like, okay, sounds good. And so I think we've had like 11 cars since then. And I, I think I've known you in the last five years with at least six of those. Yeah. <laughs> um, and a lot of that's been work trick stuff too, but it's a real issue of mine with, uh, Buying, selling, trading cars. Um, well, I think the the R eight we wrapped for you was a little more than a year ago, and you mm-hmm. now don't have that. <laughs> no, that one's gone. Uh, actually, Aaron took that picture uh, on the wall with his stupid Android, <laughs> and uh, I had it, you know, done in canvas. But um, yeah, since then we've had. Uh, let's see, we had the R eight and the RSQ eight, and then went from that to. It seems like the, the come up here is you guys have, you and Dom have uh, the his and hers kind of combos. Yeah. You have the RSQ8 and the R8, now the, the Lambo and the Urus. And now yeah. it, now it's the, uh, the ST, is the STO Evo and 600 LT? Oh, yeah. So the, uh, so the Evo has gone. It's just the uh, STO and the 600 LT. Uh, we had the Urus. Yeah. Had the, had the Urus and the Evo. And we would like go on, you know, a drive or a rally or a meetup or whatever. And, and she was like, the Urus just isn't it. Everyone's in. You got Aaron in his twin turbo Huracan or Will. The, the Urus is it in in the regular traffic around town sure. with the minivans and the X fives. But when you get into like true supercar stuff, yeah. it's now a yeah. Tahoe. Yeah, she's like, you know, this, this thing's this thing's not as loud. She says, I, I want the pops and cracks, and I want this and the exhaust. Whatever. And so, um, we got rid of the Urus, got a six hundred LT. McLaren, so we're having some McLaren stuff, but uh, she's not a passenger princess. She, she made a post the other day. She's like, I'd rather race him. Do yeah, that. yeah, yeah, I saw that. Um, but yeah, we, we we drive great. She supports me. I support her. I think that's that's what a big a big bit at least a business relationship from behind the scenes aspect is. Hope and I are the same way. I'm the same way. I'll spend ridiculous amount of money, stupid car parts, and all that stuff. Yeah. And she is savings payroll all that stuff yeah, we gotta yeah. think about the future not yeah. what we're doing this yeah. weekend yeah I agree. <laughs> um, it works well though i think opposites attract right so uh we get through it but yeah she she's great um she has helped me with my business stuff tremendously from like a marketing aspect to you know last august that tornado come through here and for two weeks straight she worked with me and the boys um and then we did work in Nashville and I have pictures of her standing out in the pouring rain 
doing a bio pond install, you know, downtown Nashville or, you know, you name it. Um, she's always like jumped right in there. And honestly, I think that's my love language. It's like I think, I think it's, it's tough to find somebody that will support you in that aspect and yeah. just about anything you'll do. Yeah. And it's not a, hey, can you do this? Well, I think about it. It's, hey, before you even finish the question, they're in the car. Yeah. She, she was like, all right, hey, let's go. And, you know, we had all that snow. She's like, hey, we got this to go do and this to go do. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't even want to do it. She's like, well, you're going to do it. Let's go do it. Right. So we have that. That helps. Um, we're kind of getting into the, well, I say we, she's flipped several houses um, and been successful with that. It's always kind of been a goal of mine or a dream of mine. My my dad come from construction stuff. So um, I made a comment to Dom. I said, I want to, you know, I'm ready to like flip a house. And uh, we were in Colorado at the time. And she was like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, cool. I'll see if I can help you find one. Right? And uh, we were engaged in nothing here at this point. Well, we come back and uh, she was like, let's go look at this flip house over here in Farragut. I was like, all right, cool, yeah, we're, we're checking it out. And uh, she comes up, she's like, what do you think? And I said, honestly, it's, it's like daunting. I don't even know. Like, what do you it's know one of those things start? you don't know what you're getting into. Yeah. yeah. And she said, well, you're under contract to buy it. And I was like, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? She's like, yeah, it's a done deal. We're doing it. We close on this day. Yada, yada. So she put that ball in motion for me. That, ex- that extra nudge to get you started? Yeah. And um, it may or may not have been a way for her, like, for us to, like, attach ourselves together. Because, like, like I said, we were just pretty new in our relationship. But um, we did. Now we're almost done with this flip house. And uh We've had our struggles with that too, but um, at the end of the day, you just got to kind of keep pushing forward with it and um, you'll miss every shot you don't take, right? That's so. that's a big one too because a lot yeah. of people get scared scared out of opportunities and that could be the next opportunity to put them into another bracket rather than just staying on that level playing field. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, we see it all the time around here with small businesses. They will they go great for two years and then that two-year mark, it just kind of – plateaus yeah. yeah there's a lot of stuff that happens after that two or three year mark you know um i i have this saying i'm not i'm not really truthfully i'm not a podcast guy i don't really watch much on youtube i don't you know well that's what you even said you made the comment the other day is if it's if it's longer than 10 minutes i ain't even i ain't even started I've never watched it right? <laughs> um my days are pretty hectic right i mean i wake up at 3 50 every morning uh and i'm at the gym and i go to bed by 8 p.m every night right but I saw a thing that uh, Joe Rogan said. He said, pretend that there's a film crew that follows you all day long and they're trying to document the early stages of your success story and see if you still act the same. And so for probably the last year, anytime I'm like struggling with something, in my mind, I just say- It kind of clicks clicks back to that. Yeah, and, and I just say film crew film crew and uh and it's been crazy for me to think you know if someone was videoing everything that you did and, and i think, think that's kind of like me asking you to do this with you not being a podcast guy you really didn't know what yeah. to expect and then as you see we're almost an hour into this yeah once you get started onto that it oh, just yeah, kind of it rolls yeah. yeah i um i was excited about it for obviously the opportunity to say like I've had a lot of that daddy's money. Yeah. The qu- the questions, the, yeah. the comments, it's, it kind of it gives you a chance to address it all. Yeah. Um, Whether they think you're full of crap or not. Right. Because sure. def- you're going to get those two. It doesn't yeah. matter what you do. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you say or do. Um, I, I can say this. There was there was a long time. There was a, there was a big period of my life when my parents made good money and I was a spoiled brat. I feel like I'm in that situation right now because our business has grown up pretty big. We mm-hmm. didn't have a lot of money before 2016. My son's 14 years old now, and he I see that in him. Yeah, it's uh, well, my my parents have have money, and he'll do that at school, and mm-hmm. they just like it kind of punches me in the stomach. I was like, yeah, man, that's not good. Yeah, I, <laughs> I get that. Yeah, um, like I said, I, I had that period. There's a period, you know, first 10, 11 years of my life, we were dirt poor. I remember coming home and there being a possum in my bathroom. And when you can remember that, that's a, it's a driving point yeah. for, to where you're at now. Um, I remember my mom and dad were always working. Uh, there was periods where my mom worked at a gas station up on Clinton Highway and we'd have to leave at, you know, 3, 4 a.m. 
I would go with her and I would sleep underneath the cash register until it was time for me to go to school. Um, so I remember that period. And then I remember the period when my parents just said, Hey, here it is. Go do what you want. Here's a credit card. The transition. Travel. Yeah. yeah. And, and truthfully, there was that, that big stretch, you know, 10 year stretch of my life where I, I was a brat. Didn't have to worry about anything. Yeah. yeah. And, no and consequences. Had no work ethic. I was lazy. I was disrespectful. I mean, I was, I felt untouchable. Right. And then there was that period when, uh, it all disappeared. And, and then we had to kind of figure out like, what do we do now? Right. Um, and that's been the longest period of trying to like figure it out. And you, you know, I was broke for a lot of that. Um, but I, I never let people know I was broke. Yeah. Um, and at the opposite end of that is there's, there's not a lot of people around that. I mean, unless you drive this, that don't, sure. you don't have that portrayal of, yeah. I have all this money. Yeah. It's you're just hanging out with people. Oh yeah. And, and I'm, I mean, I'll eat some humble pie right here. Like I don't own this car. I, I pay a fat monthly payment <laughs> for this car. The McLaren, I pay a fat monthly payment for that too. Um, I'm grateful to like get to go to work and make the money to pay the payments. But I'm I'm not going to lie and say that they're on time every day. Yeah. You know, um, at the end of the day. It's we're, tough. That's we're, Cars like this, is, yeah. it's a tough, tough obligation. We're net 30 on everything we do. So, um, and I, I'm here to tell you, sometimes net 30 is really net 45 or net 60. <laughs> yeah. Or we've got stuff from... February of 2023. Well, it's, it's even, it's a bigger scale of what you were saying is you got net 30. You had no idea how it worked and you had to ask your guys, Hey, can we wait till we get paid? Yeah. It's the same situation on a much larger scale. Yeah. It's, um, it's ridiculous. And in fact, I mean, there's, there's months where I pull money from my personal savings account or, you know, I, I had to pull all of my money out of my Robinhood account to pay payroll several weeks ago. And it's, and like I said, getting paid and money will always come first. That goes with your guys as well. As yeah. a business owner, you have to take care of your guys. Yeah. They got to get paid first. Um, but I have cool cars. We've got a nice house and, and we've got a lot of irons in the fire and all that, but, uh, it was not handed to me from my parents, but quite frankly, and, th and that's kind of why I wanted to get you on here too. Cause I had that growing up too. I grew up yeah. in a family with, with decent money and I got those comments growing up. I still do. I mean, even people think that I, I moved off hope before we even had finishing touch. Uh, and now we get yeah. the opposite comments. Like she's only with me for the company yeah. when she was a big part of building it. Yep. So it's those type of things just keep me driving and keep it, keep it going. Yeah. I got a little bit of both of it, you know, even some close friends that, that knew, you know, my parents when I was younger was just, hand me the card and whatever. And then when their business shut down, a lot of those close friends were like, Oh, Nate's screwed now. What's yeah. he going to do now? You know, nothing to benefit them now. Yeah. Right. And, um, so like my friendships, my friendships didn't really change until my parents went broke. And then, and then you realize who your friends really are. Yeah. Right? But your friends that are with you at the bottom are going to be with you on, on that climb up. Yeah. You, and, you, you lot nine times out of 10, you meet somebody at the top, that goes away and something changes. Yeah. They usually go with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and not only that, I mean, it's damn near impossible to have friends and run several businesses and have a family and, you know, spend time with your wife and it's, it's tough. And it so, takes a lot of work. It, and so you have to have friends that are on the same page. I mean, I've got buddies that I've not seen in years that, might call me once every couple of months and we just pick up like we never right where you left off. Yeah. Yep. And, um, I have one high school friend like that. It's the exact same way. I, I probably haven't seen her in 20 years mm -hmm. and she'll message me once a month on Facebook and then it'll be 15 minute conversation sure. of the catch up for the next 10 years yeah. and then nothing for months. Yeah. Uh, so it, it is, it's tough to have friendships and, and stuff like that, you know, running businesses, but, um, I can, I can certainly say that I had a lot of hate for a, a long time. A lot of it was self-inflicted, right? I mean, I, I, success is going to bring that on both sides. Yeah. You, you might, you might have that one jump where you have that little arrogance to be like, Oh, I'm doing good. You have that kind of puts it off. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, you have people just hate the success that they yeah. don't have it. And you do. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I'll say a lot of it was self-inflicted and, you know, like I said, that period of my life, I was not a good dude. And, uh, 
I felt untouchable and I was a brat. And, and so, you know, I've burned a lot of bridges that way. Um, and I can own that. Um, but, you know, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, and And I can say this. If I was filthy rich, I'm going to give it to my kids too. Yeah. Like who? And that's, that's, that's what a lot of people don't understand is if you had the opportunity to do that, you're not going to want your kids to fail. Yeah. Or th- them to struggle. Yeah. You're going to help them. It's, it's just part of it. Yeah. It's part of it. And uh, I mean the whole like daddy's money comment. Sure. <laughs> if like, Hey, if, if your dad, if was my not- parents would pay for a house or have me live at home and I don't have any bills, I would absolutely do it. Tell them no? <laughs> no. If your dad was rich and he said, Hey, here's this, here's a house for you to live in. Yeah, absolutely. You say, no, I want to work hard for it. Hell no. You're going to take it. <laughs> And, and you'll take that comment too, because I promise it's easier to sleep at night in a nice comfy bed, knowing that your dad helped you buy it versus you just worked a hundred hour a week to be able to afford it. And you can't, en- you can't and, enjoy it at all. Yeah. yeah it's like, it, it is what it is. You, you'd take it a hundred times over. Nobody's going to turn it down. I was just fortunate enough that my parents' hard work, and dedication and sacrifices well, and oh, I think yeah. I think a lot of that their business kind of on the downhill spiral really helped you make you into the yeah. business person you are today mm-hmm. because you had a taste of that life and then it was gone. Yeah, you have to get back there. Yeah, so a lot of people are working towards never having ha- had that experience and they don't know if it's worth it or not. Yeah, they're working towards something that seems unobtainable, but you know that's kind of what they're chasing. For me, it was. And I've been here before yeah. and I, I know what it's like and, um, and I got to get back to that. And now, uh, we have good months and we have bad months and, and you know, just like any other business, but, uh, it's a big swing. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a big, it's bigger swings, but I, I find so much gratitude now in, uh, you know, I, I took my whole family to Fleming's last night for dinner for my nephew's birthday. And I mean, we had a $1,500 dinner tab. And it's so, it feels so good to just pay for dinner. Well, they can, even if they haven't had that experience before, they now have that experience. We do a lot of the guys that have been with us 12 months or more. We take on a huge trip at the end of the year, whether it be SEMA, whether it be something else. And we always pay for dinner for everybody there. And I think our last dinner was around that 1,500, 2,000 mark. And it's nice to be able to do that because you you work them hard all year round. You see the work they do. They see the the rough weeks. Like you see them get frustrated and you're able to, Plane tickets, hotel rooms, Vegas, sure. dinner. And yeah. it's kind of like, let's just relax. Have fun. Let's do do yeah. Don't worry about the menu pricing. Just order what you want. Yeah, I agree. Uh, none of my family prior to last night had been to Fleming's. And uh, I mean, I think I've been two or three times. But uh, it's a cool experience to be able to be in a position now to to do things like that for people that you care about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's cooler than any car you can drive, right? That's that's one of the things I liked about the TDC that we're going to talk about with Matt next week is the charity events that go along with that. It's not yeah. just a car meet to go have fun with everybody oh, in the yeah. cars. It's doing something for the community. It's helping someone. Yeah. I, um, I think my favorite thing about driving the cars is, you know. The kids. Yeah. Aaron's really big with it. Well, yeah, you got a Lamborghini, sit in it. Yeah, like, do it. Don't uh, don't tell them not to touch it. Get yeah, in. It. I, I've had I've had kids, you know, hop in, rev it up, start it, pictures in it, you know, you name it, and um, I love that. And honestly, if you look to, so I dropped out of high school, right? So this tag says uh, GED, and then the six hundred, the tag says uh, zero GPA. Not that I'm against education; it just wasn't. It wasn't my thing. I'm against education when it comes to being an entrepreneur. If you want yeah. to work for somebody or work for a company, absolutely go to school, get college, do all that. Yeah. You can, you have to learn as you go when it comes to building a business, yeah. especially when it's revolved around specifics to you. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's, there's no booklet that you can be like, do this and you'll have a successful business. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. And my favorite question that I get, you know, when I drive the car is, man, I, I love your car. What do you do for work? And my response is always, I'm not in real estate. <laughs> um, and then I'll just say, if you know, take a, I want you to just take a guess, right? And they're like, uh, 
cryptocurrency. My that's because you're young, tattoos, yeah, all that right. stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm I'm not a felon. I get right? I get the, I get yeah. that question. I'm like I wash cars. They're like you what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I know. I I think everyone thinks I sell drugs or I don't know. I, I don't sell drugs. I, I couldn't. Well, it's, it's, I'll, right I'll post the meme that I posted the other day on the, on the video. It uh, said, uh, "Have a grind, have a grind so big that people that only think the way you can achieve that goal is to sell drugs." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, um, I don't have an OnlyFans, and I don't sell drugs. Um, I have not been to jail. You I, have the worth the work ethic. Yeah, that's, that's it. I, but I I look like uh, I I like to fit that all of those things. Right? Yeah, um, <laughs> but. You know, the question, what do you do for work? How do, how do you afford these cars? And I, I always, I always want them to guess because it's intriguing. To yeah. To and see the, what people are kind of what they put putting them, together. Yeah. What they think you have to do to, to afford those cars. And, and I'll say, oh, I, I own a landscape company. I'm, like, what? I'm sorry, what? I'm like, yeah, we mow a lot of grass. <laughs> and um, man, I will see so many kids. They're, like I just cut our neighbor's grass, mom. Yeah, their whole world would, will change, and they think like, "Oh my god!" Either he mows all of East Tennessee, or like, or there can be a future in this. And um, I don't want anybody else to start a landscape company because we've got plenty of them here. <laughs> um, but I think that's the same thing in every service in any service yeah. industry that's seasonal. Yeah, it's detailing and landscaping. Springtime pops up. There's yeah. 17 companies, but when wintertime rolls around, they all Nobody's disappear. There. Yeah. Um, fortunately for us, our contracts are all 12 month contracts, so we do get paid in the wintertime too. Um, but like I said, you, you don't have to. You don't have to have a college degree. You don't. Uh, I mean. You don't have to finish high school, right? Yeah, and any parents listening to this, don't take that as a tell your parents, the kids not to yeah, go to school. I'm not saying drop it's out. It's just just what what's worked and what's doable. School my, isn't the end all yes, be all. My my kids, well, absolutely, all finish school, and if they ever want a piece of daddy's pie, then they're going to go to school to do so, whether it be a trade school or whatever, like. You're going to work for daddy's money. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Which I didn't work for my dad's money, but um, I'm not against education. I, I'm against laziness. Right. And I don't want someone that's bad in school to think that because they don't have that degree or because I didn't finish school that I was terrible in school. Like I didn't yeah. have a great GPA. I was, I was C's and D's my whole, my whole school career. Yeah. Something just, just changes. Yeah, I, I think uh, some people are just kind of wired different. And I forget the statistic. Cool, I have to look it up. But I think it's like seven out of ten millionaires are dropouts. Something, you know, you just kind of wired different. And um, I think for me, it was like when I when I dropped out of school, I felt like I was stuck in a corner. And so I was like, man, I got to go to work now. Um, so I don't know. I, we try to inspire kids just to to work hard, find something that you enjoy, find find a trade or a passion that also helps people, right? Um, that's, that's really what's going to get people paid the most is if you can make yeah. a difference in the world to other people, it's just like entertainment. Like you yeah. look at athletes and movies, they're, they're entertainers and everybody thinks they get paid too much, but right. they're changing the lives of millions of people, not just a community. Yeah, it's, Think about it when a celebrity dies, how many people get so upset they come to tears and somebody that they've never met. Yeah. That's they change lives in that, in that drastic way. Yeah. Yeah. Which is wild to me, but, um, yeah, I agree. I, um, I, I want to see this younger generation and I want to see trades continue to go the way that they're going. And like I said, with, with I think that I think they're going to versus like it used to be, you got to go to college, got to get a good job, all this and that. And now it's shifted with so much stuff you can learn on the internet just yeah. from just from searching. Yeah. Trade school is going to be where it's at. I agree. I, I've, um, I'm a big fan of Justin Waller. And in an interview, they said, you know, what's going to be the next big thing to to be a multimillionaire? And he said, be a plumber. Because like they're they're not making them anymore and well so you think of like plumbers and funeral homes and mm -hmm. all of that is gonna have to be around forever yeah they don't have to make supercars right but people are gonna die 
people are going to have to get plumbing in the house. Yeah. It's going to be there. Yeah. There's those, there's those like necessary trades. And if you can just find that and, you know, enjoy it. And, and whatever you choose, choose to be the best at it. Don't just yeah. do the minimum to get, get by. Yeah. If you're the best at it. You will separate yourself from everybody else. Yeah. I agree. Um, anyway, so that's always kind of been my, you know, philosophy on this stuff is just work hard. Uh, I always tell my guys, just be ready for it. And there will be an opportunity that will present itself. But if you're not looking for it and you're not ready for it, it'll pass you up and you may not get another one. Right. And so, well, it's kind of like the red car theory is if I tell you yeah. not to look at a red car, that's all you're going to see from right, here to the mall. mall. Yeah. If I don't tell you that you're going to miss them all. And that could be every opportunity that goes by just because I, you're not looking for them. Absolutely. The day that she called me and asked me to come mow that property, if I hadn't been sitting on go and ready for it, it would have passed me up and I, and I wouldn't have any of the ones I have now. Right. I would have never got there. So just kind of, you know, be prepared, be ready for it. Keep your eyes peeled for it. Look for opportunity. And they're not obvious. It's, it's something that you really got to be conscious of. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's pretend there's always a film crew following you around watching your every move to document your success story. And in 10 years, you can sit down with your family and watch it on Netflix and, <laughs> yeah. and you know, and make sure that you're making all the right moves now. And learn from or be mistakes. invited to a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Or do a podcast. yeah so um, I did, I, I disclaimed to my family last night. I said, Hey, just, just so it's said, like, don't take anything I say too serious and don't think that I'm like, it's at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's part of the story. It's what yeah. gets, it's what got you here. Yeah. Um, some people are embarrassed for their failures. Others embrace it. It's sure. It's part of it. Yeah, I agree. Um, my family all supports it now. You know, we're like, so I have several family members that, that work for me and with me and, um, we're doing it. It's a, it's a everyday thing. You, you have to choose to do that every day. Um, Early to rise, early to bed, you know, it's not an overnight thing. Yeah. That, that's a big one. Everybody now wants instant gratification. Yeah. If they can't get it right away, they quit. Yeah. And you just, it's never going to work out that way. Yeah, I agree. There's a, there's a period, like I said, when uh, we worked seven twelves for seven months straight and I, I would come home and I would sit in the shower just in tears because my feet hurt so bad. And, you know, I was worked to the bone and I, and I thought, there's no way that I can do this forever. And I think it's, it's when you're like at rock bottom, when you start making moves that change it. And, and, you know, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at now if we hadn't lost our business. Or, we've, we've come across many people like that, even as employees that have come and gone, you see their life outside of work and yeah. they're struggling to pay bills. They're struggling with their family and you try to do everything you can for help them right down to buying groceries, making car sure. payments for them. And it comes down to, they still continue to make the same mistakes. And yeah. finally it comes to that point where they have to hit the bottom yeah. to know what it is. Yeah. And, and what may appear to be the bottom to you may not be the bottom to them. Right? And, and so for me, it was to the outside world. I'm still driving a brand new truck and I'm mowing and I'm making, you know, a few hundred bucks a week and I, and I was doing all right. And, but for me, I was at rock bottom Yeah, and, um, and I didn't see like, you know, the, the end of that inside, but I was looking for it. And when the opportunity popped up and I jumped on it, then, you know, it turned to what it is now. Um, and like I said, and we're not the biggest landscape company We're uh, by any means. Right. Um, but I enjoy what we do. We've got great staff. Every, every Good story clients. that we have comes across, there's this one turning point that you can focus on that be like, that was it. That's what turned the path yeah. into, into that uphill battle. Oh, for sure. For me, it was the phone call to mow that one property, seeing that opportunity, trying to push it for the two properties and then trading my truck for a flatbed. Because I swear, if you pull into a job site and you drive a flatbed truck, it looks like you were you so work. dedicated yeah. to work. Yes. At and the same time, you get the the general contractors that show up in the nice Duramax Dually Denali's and yeah. be like, he doesn't work at all. Yep, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, just this year, you know, I, I, I had a 23 F450 Platinum on 28s and 38s. And Is that the, the two brothers build? Yep. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to try to get Billy and Mac on here eventually. Oh yeah, I, I don't. Have, <laughs> I, I absolutely don't have Billy and Mac money. But, um, they're they're great people too. They they take good care of me on all my all my vehicles. Um, but I traded it, got two new flatbed work trucks, and now my daily driver is a flatbed, flatbed work truck on American Forces and you know whatever. But um, I swear, your revenue will go up if you get away from just like the arrogant looking, flashy looking pickup. And that's what that's what I did with the uh, the Duramax I have for the shop. Granted, it's on forces and it's lifted. Mm-hmm. I traded in a 2019 L5P Duramax, 10 inch lift, uh, yeah. done at two brothers. And yeah. when I switched to the 2016 Duramax, it kind of dulled it down a little yeah. bit. You notice that people look at you differently. For sure. Yeah. You, you can't look like you make too much money and you can't pull into a job site and just look like you're flat broke. You have to look, you have to meet that. You have to play, meeting. you have to play the part basically. Yeah. Um, and it honestly, it comes easier when you are just dedicated to your craft. I don't want to drive a flatbed (laughs) vinyl floor truck. I don't want to drive that every day, but for me and my business and what I do, it, it works. It helps just like I drove the X five today, which is normally hopes car and it's, it's wrapped, it's coated, it's Mm -hmm. tinted. That grabs attention that allows me to get more business when we go to Sam's club or anything like that. I can't get that with the truck because it's got dents in it and everything. Sure. So I can't, I can't focus. Yeah. We're one of the best detail companies in, in the state. Mm-hmm. They'll look at me like I'm crazy. Yeah. I, <laughs> I get that. And then it was like, on the other hand, I, when I bought the R8, I mean, right off the bat, my, my like circle of friends or acquaintances immediately changed. Right. Uh, it was like two or three weeks into it. I remember I, I went to dinner with like Aaron Fowler and Eli Quorum and Harper Jones and all and all those younger big money dudes because they all drove supercars. Well, I, I felt the same way when we bought the GTR, the first mm-hmm. GTR we had. The friendship circle not necessarily opened up, but it's just like the watch community. Everybody knows I'm big into watches. It's a conversation starter to yeah. those people that you really want to be around. Sure. Yeah, I, I can say uh, that I have... I have made more friends and acquaintances from the supercar community that will benefit you. Not just because you drive the same thing that will benefit you. I I mean, I've, I've met people in Nashville that, you know, are making eight, nine figures a year and they're in their twenties and it's all because they were driving down Broadway in their McLaren and we were in the RA and we just have, I'm like, Hey, he's young. Hey, he's young. Yeah. And then we just well, it it, go, it goes back to the kind of little situation of stories of friends. If you hang out with five people, you know nothing about what they're talking about. So put like boiled eggs for scrambled eggs for reasons. Mm-hmm. If they're experts in scrambled eggs, four of them and you, mm-hmm. and you hang around with them for a while, you're gonna gain that knowledge yeah. just by being around that that those type of people. Yeah, absolutely. not necessarily because you want to. You'll just absorb it. Yeah, and then eventually, you'll get to that knowledge yeah. and be able to have that conversation with somebody yeah. else. I agree with that. We um, we've entertained the idea of, of getting membership at Flat Rock, right? And not because I'm a race car driver, but simply it's because networking. The members that will be at Flat Rock that you know that will go there, spend time there, that you can become friends with and, and acquaintances with, and, and the networking that will come from that will pay for your. There's, there's no there's no price to put on knowledge obtained. Yeah. You just can't. And there's no way to describe it until you kind of get into that world. Yeah, absolutely. And then you also, you're a member at Flat Rock, right? <laughs> yeah. So, it's like, so if you want to race your car, you can. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even, even if you walked away from it and you never met a soul there, you have a lifetime membership at Flat Rock and you get to race your car, right? But um, it's all that networking, networking events. Uh, you got to do that like internal work, right? To be prepared to do it. Uh, to jump when someone says jump, but that's really it. That's where we're at. Well, we're an hour and 20 minutes into this now. I think that's a good, a good stopping point. Sure. Is your, your circle of friends is, is a big part of your personality and the way you yeah. view the world. If you, if you hang out with people that are just pieces of crap, have no motivation, it's going to wear off on you. And oh, it'll, it'll, it'll be the same way. So you kind of yeah. want to be around those that you want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the best advice I can give to anybody that's building a business. Yeah. And you know what? It, that's tough. It, it's tough to become friends with someone that, that you feel maybe like 
out of your league. For example, all all the guys that you know that I went to dinner with, they're out of my league. They make way more money than I make. And and the common ground was that we all love cars, right? And um I swear my business doubled when I bought the R8 because my network changed. And once your network changes, it was the same thing. We brought the GTR and our clientele went from your hundred thousand dollar cars into your yeah. two fifty to five hundred thousand dollar cars. Yep. Absolutely. It was uh it wasn't so much that, you know, all the people I've become friends with sent me work, but it's a trust it's a trust building thing. Well, and it was a mindset change for me. I see these guys and I see what they do and how they do it in totally different fields. Um, and then you realize that, you know, oh, the X amount of dollars I make a month now really is, is it's not, it's a, it's the other bracket. It's yeah. I mean, you think it, like, going in, into the Dubai world is nobody oh, there, cares about money. There's always some richer. You make, richer you make a certain yeah. amount of money where the, there's no such thing as price. It's if mm-hmm. you want it, you go get it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it, that is it, it can go for as, as far as you can you can think of and beyond that. Yeah, no, I agree. So yeah, like I said, networking was was huge for us too. But my networking didn't didn't really start until I bought the R eight. Um, that w- that was your opportunity to kind of get your foot in that door. Yeah, um, and that was Eli Quorum's fault. Uh, I was walking down Gay Street Bridge, uh, heading home, and he come flying by me. Uh, and I just looked up, you know, saw the car and saw his tag said Eli. And I, thought, <laughs> and I was standing there for a minute and I thought, I'm going to buy an R8. And uh, that was it. That started this whole thing. I mean, and, and people say cars aren't investments. That's that's the investment right there. Yeah. It might not have been yeah. the car itself that could sell for more, but yeah. the knowledge gained Absolutely. from those opportunities. The, the mindset change, the confidence change, you know, all of that r- right off the bat from getting the car. Um, which sounds so silly to think like, oh, I bought this car. And then once I get the car, then, you know, my, my whole business structure and stuff changed, but it created, it created an opportunity to meet people that were like-minded, but had more knowledge and, and to take that and apply it in your own life. And that makes all the difference. So who, who you're around plays a big part of the person you are and where yeah. you're going to go. Yeah, absolutely. And then having somebody at home that supports it. Um, that's huge. You know, the, the days that I get burnt out and I don't want to do it. And Dom says, Hey, you got to go. Hey, get your ass out of bed. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> and, and I mean, she supports me a ton, a ton of help. Hey, your lunch is packed. Go. You got to go. You got a busy day. You got, you know, um, that's huge. So you got to have good people in your corner with my staff too. I can just say, Hey guys, I, I need a day. Y'all Hold it down. All right, cool. You got it, boss. You know, no big deal. Understood. And then I can check out for the day. I never make it very long. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like, all right, I'm really very much, I'm very much like I am with the phone. But like, how'd that go? Yeah. Not necessarily because you're worried. You just, you want to be a part of it. Yeah. Um, my sister is my assistant. And I had to, I had to show her the other day how to put her phone on sleep mode <laughs> and set the time, you know, where from like 9 p.m. until 6 a.m. Her phone's on sleep mode. Yeah. And I was like, let me have it so I can show you, you know, how to do this. And she's like, what are you doing? I text her at 4 a.m. I'm like, hey, today we're doing X, Y, and Z. And this just to is- update her, not necessarily to talk to her. Yeah. But just to. Because I'm at the gym and I'm, I might be, you know, finished with my workout and doing some cardio. And, and I'm saying, here's what we're doing today. I need you to do this and that and this and that. Check that. But I, I feel guilty because I'm texting her at, you know, 4, 5, 6 a.m. So having that where she's like accepting to that. We found a good balance with like, Hey, your phone's on sleep mode. It shouldn't wake you up. You know? I, I try to get a lot of the guys that answer, answer the phones or answer page messages. I was like, you cannot answer a client back if they message at 11 o'clock. Oh yeah. Cause they are always going to expect that yeah. back. If, if it happens. Yeah. It took me a long time. Cause I was 24 seven when I first started, I was, mm-hmm. it would 1am message come in. I'm messaging them right back. Yeah. Now it's kind of trying to separate your personal life from that work life. For sure. If someone texts me and a lot of people that are watching this probably can vouch for this. If you text me at 9 p.m., you will get a text back at 4 a.m. <laughs> like, and I mean, it's just because I'm asleep and, you know, my day starts early and I have to get some of that stuff out of the way before I can like, yep. actually, you know, get to work. But 
Um, it's addicting that, that like early to rise and I have that like safe place to go, to go train in the mornings, kind of get my mind right. I have to let that stress out before I go to work. I'd lose my mind on everybody. Um, but during that period, it's like, I'm texting people back and I'm catching up on stuff. That's a big part of business too is communication and yeah. not necessarily like, Hey, they messaged you three days ago. Let's respond. It's yeah. Respond now. Like yeah. just do it. Yeah. it. It's five seconds. I, yeah. And I, I'll always, you know, Hey, I, sorry. I know it's 4 a.m. But you know, here we are. I, I always kind of disclaimer and, and apologize in the text when I send them early, but um, it is what it is. It's part of it. Well, I appreciate you spending the time. I know yeah. it's, it's, it's been a minute and kind of gives, the inside of people that don't see you in this light as far as behind the cars and behind sure. the business. Um, but like I told, like I, I told in our first episode with Frank, it's, we might have a lot of followers right now. I think we're, we just crossed 500 last night, cool. but if it affects one person in that journey, that's all yeah. that matters. That's all we're going for. I'm not looking to make a business out of this. It's, it's more yeah. of an inspiration thing. Kind yeah, of. Yeah. If you can inspire people and help somebody. And um, I'm always open you know, I'm always open to people that that just message and and have questions or advice. Well, a lot of people don't don't know you like that too. They see your appearance, the tattooed neck yeah. and arms, and it's it's almost like sometimes they're scared to approach you because they're gonna have that prisoner mentality. Oh yeah, because I look like a prisoner. yeah. You're an awesome yeah. dude. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, sometimes I'm a you prisoner. can be yeah. yeah. But every um, everybody has that yeah. Um, but I, I'm always open to just having conversations and helping people. I mean, I was there too. You know what I mean? And and I didn't really have anybody like my parents did great and they run their business, but they didn't they didn't teach me the stuff about taxes and payroll and nobody does, not even school, which kind yeah. of blows my mind in this aspect and the experience I have now with running a business. Yeah. Is that school doesn't teach stuff like this. I know. Yeah, it's crazy. But um I'm always open, you know, to to helping people and just kind of pointing people in the right direction. And if I can, right. Um, and it may not be the best advice and it might be totally wrong, but uh, if I can relate to it and help them by all means. Cool deal. If you guys need any landscaping or tree work, I'll post the, uh, the company name and phone number in the description. Yeah. And at the end of the episode, uh, give Nathan a call. If you have any questions, concerns, um, go ahead, like, and subscribe. If you can do that, we greatly appreciate it. We appreciate your time, man. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. 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 I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. There's a the logo right there. <laughs> yeah. We'll see All you guys right. next week, Monday at 12 o'clock. We'll be with Matthew Argon from the TDC club. Sweet. As we close this chapter, I encourage you to keep climbing, keep pushing beyond your limits, and keep believing in your ability to overcome whatever obstacles stand in your way. Until next time, keep striving, keep reaching, and keep climbing the ladder to success. We'll see you next week.